Welcome to another episode of The Conversation, um, the Dakota Election Central Edition, as we are covering the 2024 North Dakota election cycle. I'm Jonathan Starr, and today it is an honor and a pleasure to be joined by Dr. Rick Becker. Thank you for joining us today. You bet. Happy to be on. Absolutely. So before we jump into uh, the world of politics, why don't we just lead off with, tell us a little bit about Dr. Becker. Who, who are you? Um, your family, your practice, everything that you have going on. Sure. Well, I'm originally from Mandan. So um, grew up in Mandan, North Dakota, graduated high school there. Uh, went to UND for undergraduate school and for medical school and for general surgery residency. And then uh, I had to go onward for plastic surgery training, which I did in um, Detroit and Manhattan and Little Rock, Arkansas. And wow. then when I finally, finally got, uh, was able to hang out a shingle, I came back to North Dakota, uh, opened my first practice in Bismarck in December of 1997. So I've been in practice since that time. Uh, I've opened some businesses, a, uh, a Medi spa, uh, bar and restaurant, and um, doing some real estate stuff. In 2000, Nine, 2008, nine, I uh, began to get much more involved in politics than I had previously. There were there was kind of a confluence of things on the federal level and the state level uh, where we were spending, it seemed to me, spending ourselves into oblivion federally, um, increasing government and, uh, you know, with the, the uh, financial crisis and, and so forth, really expanded government's role and expanded the view that government is the solution to the problem when in fact it was largely the responsible for the problem in my opinion and then on a state level uh same thing we were at that point just starting to ramp up into having uh, increased oil revenue and over the course of 2010 11 12 it became very clear that the state the legislature didn't really have much of an appetite for for um, restraining the growth of government and right. taking that newfound revenue and and in, instead of increasing spending uh, to give people tax breaks. And so I started to get involved. I was in the legislature for 10 years. I started the Bastiat Caucus. It's been that name has been kind of um, uh, has a negative connotation because of a lot of mainstream media stuff. But really, the Bastiat Caucus started out my very first year in 2013 in the legislature because there wasn't a lot of communication between the conservative, the very, very few cons truly conservative legislators. And I wanted there to be a way that we could communicate better, that we could go over bills, do whatever we could uh, in, in a more unified fashion to get good bills passed and to kill bad bills. And it, it kind of grew from there. So that was uh, North Dakota's version of the Freedom Caucus. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I've been a, a, a significant uh, stalwart of conservatism, limited government, maximum freedom. Yeah, uh, I have a good reputation for standing firm on my principles. So, so you mentioned, we... sorry, but you mentioned the ba Bastiat Caucus and some of the perception that has happened with it. Why is there such a divide right now in politics it's started several years ago, but where it seems like there's no ability to work together. Minimal. No would be too strong, but a minimal ability to work together. And there's this rivalry. It's not that you're Republican, I'm a Democrat. There's this rivalry where it boils blood when you find out somebody opposes your your viewpoints. Why is this happening? And, and why... We see this in Congress, and we see it to a degree in North Dakota as well. From your perspective, being in the trenches, why why is this formed? Well, if we speak about the the differences of what's happening within the Republican Party, that that has actually been longstanding. Uh, the Goldwater uh, conservatives uh, of the '60s uh, were trying to uh, compete with the Rockefeller, moderate, more progressive Republicans. And that's just carried on a decade after decade. It's just a, right. it's it's the natural uh, thing that happens in a in a political party. You could say the Democrats maybe are, are there's factions of this very strong identity politics and uh, progressive, you know, movement with transgenderism and stuff. But then I think that there's a lot of Democrats in North Dakota that don't really identify with that. Uh, they identify with a different form of what they see as being a Democrat. So in the Republican Party, we still have the same old, same old, which is there are those of us that are 
conservative and believe really, really strongly in the platform uh, of the party, which is uh, things like limited government and personal responsibility and um, minimal taxation, things like that. But then there's a, the other faction that believes uh, a bit more in the sense of, um, you know, we, we've got these great ideas. We can take the revenue from the state and implement these ideas that we think are going to be good for the economy versus those of us that say there is nothing better for the economy than to leave people's money in their own pockets rather than taxing them and then doing some sort of central planning. Um, so that's what we have. These two factions, you've got the moderates. Yeah that are bigger government and you've got the conservatives. I think that the there there's a lot more um, animosity or it's a little more intense, I would say in large part because for a long time now, the more moderates uh, have been, ha had a good strong control of the party. And they have had kind of a club of sorts. You know, there's, you play the game, you get along, and you advance. Um, people are chosen as heir apparents for almost coronations for elected office statewide rather than having a good, you know, um, political fisticuffs, if you will. Right. And so we come in as conservatives, and we sort of are breaking that up. We're pointing out, look, you say you're conservative. You say you adhere to the platform of the Republican Party, but you're not. You're not in, in this way, in this way, in this way. And so we're we're, we're, I guess, exposing that. We're trying to hold them accountable. And it's really not them versus us. I want to hold everyone accountable. People who have been in the Basia Caucus know that I, I'm pretty relentless. I will, I will hold you accountable and I want you to hold me accountable. Right. Because we're supposed to be there to represent the things we told the voters we stood for. Mm -hmm. But in large part, that's not happening. So when you have someone like us, that come in and they upset the apple cart, they expose things, they demand accountability, that makes it very uncomfortable for the, again, the country club sort of moderate Republicans. And so they hate that. They like the club the way it is. And that's where I think we see so much of the conflict. Right. So at, in the state of North Dakota politics right now, um, you have that heir apparent, um, if you would, run, running for governor. Uh, Kelly Armstrong's been around for a while, um, has established, is leaving the seat that you're running for. Um, and I believe that somebody just threw their name into the hat today. Um, so that'll be an interesting race. Um, our Lieutenant governor did. Um, but that leaves a really interesting race that you're running in with you being a candidate, Tom Campbell being a candidate and Trig V hammer currently being, uh, the, the candidates for this house of representatives seat. Do you feel there's no error parent? There's not somebody that, well, I guess if there was an error parent, it would be you. you. You're the one that probably has had their name out there the most for something like this. How do you feel this going down? Do you feel this is going to be a very competitive race? Do you feel um, it going through the primary? Do you feel this is a chance for the Democrats to finally get a hold uh, back into one of those major positions in North Dakota? So to the to the last part of the question, I don't think this is an opportunity for the Democrats so much. I it, the the opportunity for Democrats is to have an outstanding candidate, uh, and then to have that candidate be in a race where it's not against an incumbent. That's their opportunity. I don't think that uh, Trigby Hammer has the you know the the accolades, the name recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know he's not going to be at the level of a Heidi Heitkamp. Right. And um, but as far as within the Republican primary goes, yes. So we've got uh, Tom Campbell and Julie Fedorchek uh, in so far. And there's rumor that there may be another person. And I would say when we're looking at the establishment, you asked, you know, who's the heir apparent? Who's the establishment? I can tell you that the establishment folks and establishment's a weird word. It's uh, but the folks that are part of the country club crowd, the more. Uh, I call them squishes, but the more moderates, the big government Republicans really, really hate the idea of any possibility of me actually getting to Congress and representing North right. Dakota and holding other congressmen accountable the same way that I held legislators accountable in the state. They hate that idea. For some reason, they did not get behind um, Tom Campbell. I thought they would, but they didn't. That's not who they wanted. They wanted someone. Maybe they maybe they feel like they can't control him. I don't know. Right. Uh, maybe they feel he's not a strong enough candidate. I don't know. But yep. the 
uh, Julie Fedorchek is the yeah. establishment's um, person that they're going to put into power to carry out what they view as as uh, what represents them a more moderate right. uh, approach, a go along to get along approach. So if 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 there was an an heir apparent it, to that model, it's it's Julie Fedorchek. Absolutely. So in 2022, um, there was obviously the race for the uh, John Hovind's uh, Senate seat. Um, mm-hmm. In that, th- there was comments. It was an interesting race. It was a good race, and it was neat to see some more blood uh, uh, in the Republican Party going at those and going and establishing that just because you're elected doesn't mean that or just because you're an incumbent doesn't mean that you automatically get the seat. You have to keep honest to the people. At the Republican convention, there was the statement made, um, and Hovind never made the statement, but the statement was made that we would respect whatever the voters decided at that convention uh, for the Republican convention. Then you chose to run as an independent following that. So you did not run to that comment. You did not run as a Republican. But do you feel like that was misleading at all, uh, running as an independent versus running as a Republican on the primary? Yeah, good question. It, it wasn't misleading, um, and it wasn't my intention when I said it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, so we, I ran at the convention. It was a very close convention. It was. I, I, uh, I said I was going to honor the convention, and, and what the convention is is uh, who the state party is endorsing to go on to the primary. That, that's what honoring the convention means. It has nothing to do with anything else. Um, the, at the time, also, it looked like we were going to win the convention. And then things changed, and Fargo brought in a couple of buses and won't get into any of that. But, but uh, John Hoven pulled out a victory in the convention. And I immediately had people saying, you, you got to run in the primary. There was a lot of hanky-panky going on here. And, um, and I just said, nope, I, I, I said I wasn't going to. I'm not going to. Right. Um, when we, the ensuing months came, several months later, and and our inflation was skyrocketing, and I we had Senator Hoven coming out and talking, decrying the spending and how we have to get a control of inflation. It just really maddened me. I mean, I, uh, he's one of the big spenders. He's one of the one of the many people out in Washington that that vote yes on these horrible spending bills that are actually directly responsible for inflation. And yet here he was having the gall to come and say, we have to decrease spending. And I just said, you know what, I've had, this isn't about Republicans and Democrats. This is about trying to hold someone who, who in my opinion, um, believed himself to be untouchable and to try and get some accountability. And I think we did that in the campaign. Now, here's why I don't think it was going back or pulling a fast one on the delegates. When you don't run in the, in the primary and you run as, a, as an independent in the general election, it is infinitely harder. It, it almost Absolutely. never happens. I can tell you, for, a, for a, a non-statewide incumbent to run as an independent for the Senate against a Republican and a Democrat, two times in the entire history of the United States has an independent garnered more than 20%. Wow. 1940s, actually, the guy was from North Dakota. He got in the in the low 20s. And in the 1970s, there was a guy from one of the southern states that also got in the mid-20s. Uh, and he had just won the National NAACP Man of the Year Award. Wow. So a huge so, new ID. Right. So it's not... I respected... I mean, the 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 to go in the primary would have been the thing to do. That would have actually been a very tight race. Mm-hmm. But I respected what I said at the convention and what happened later as an independent in the general. That's an apples to oranges sort of thing. Okay. So then following that up, do you think, and you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to, but do you think it's fair, the rule then where the Republicans now will not allow you to be endorsed at their convention um, because you ran as an independent? Sure. Well, first off, I will answer all questions. Uh, but secondly, uh, do I think it's, I, let me say this. I don't think it's unfair. Okay. I think it's a bad rule. It's right. a, it's a, it's a bad rule. It's to the detriment of the delegates more than anything. I knew of the rule when I chose to run against Hoven as an independent, I knew what it was. And I, I still felt passionate enough that I wanted to do that. Um, and so I'm not going to say it's unfair. It was in place. I knew about it. 
Yep. I knew what I was getting myself into. Nobody's whining. I'm, I'm not whining about it. Now, I suggest that they change it. I think it's probably too late to change it now, but I mean next year or whenever the next opportunity is, I think they should change it. The rule we're talking about is if you run as an independent or if you come from another party, you can't seek the endorsement at the GOP convention for six years. You can still run in the primary as a Republican, which is what I'm forced to do. But that's part of fence building. They implemented several rules that were fence building rules that made it harder for people to come from the grassroots and and uh, seek the endorsement at the state convention. That was one of them. You know, all you're doing there is so let's say, for instance, the delegates at the convention really despise the fact that that will just use me as the example that I ran against Hoven. Great. Let me run at the convention. They're going to say no. Right. Let's let them speak. So, right. so I don't think it's unfair, but I think it's a bad rule. It doesn't help the party and it doesn't help um, interest in attending conventions as a delegate. I, I intend to move on quickly, but just as a small follow up to that, do you think it would be a, do you think it would be good, not just better, but a good rule if it was just prohibiting people from actually another party, not prohibiting people that ran as independents? So if you're a Democratic, then you'd have yeah. to wait six years. Well, arguably, you could say that's less, less, um, less bad. But but what I would say to my conservative friends is think about that rule that you've proposed. Ron Paul ran as a libertarian. Okay. And can, there's not too many Republicans that are more stalwarts in conservatism than him. So right. again, let the vote, let the delegates or the voters speak. Uh, giving them, taking away options for them is not the right way to go. So for this campaign, what are your top three key issues that you are campaigning on for, for Congress? Well, we could say money, 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 uh, one, two, and three. Yeah. Um, so being in the, the debt that we have in this country is our number one threat. Number one threat to our continued existence, to our continued prosperity uh, as a country. We have to get that under control. It is solely due to the ineptness um, of the elected officials, the spinelessness, the unwillingness to stand for any kind of principle to recognize that it's more important to do the right thing than it is to get reelected. So we're voting for continuing resolutions. We're kicking the can down the road constantly. We're voting. We just we just voted uh, in the Senate at least a couple nights ago. Uh, for for another what is it ninety billion uh, dollar package to Ukraine, Israel, right. and other places, um, we're we're just spending like crazy. It's as though there's no concept of consequences down the road. So spending is big, and and spending does go into then other facets. It goes into as I started to allude to the um, uh, uh, international uh, funding, foreign aid. We call it. It's a bunch of bull crap for the most part. You know, we're saying I, I, I respect Israel and I respect Israel's right to defend itself completely. But sending billions and billions of dollars to Israel, they are less in debt than we are. Right. I understand they may even have a surplus. I don't know. But the point is, we're in the hurt bag. We have no yeah. there's no place for us to be lending money, even to our friends, Israel. Also, we're sending money to Israel's enemies. And we have been. How about instead of sending it to Israel and Israel's enemies, we just maybe let the uh, the taxpayers keep it and we don't keep keep taxing them, or at least we don't go further into debt. Right. Ukraine, you know, th that's another example. So there's a lot of foreign areas that we need to pull back from these endless wars, things like that. The southern border, for if you want a legitimate one, two, three answer, it's going to be spending the southern border, and then the the more of a globalist woke attack on our culture. Uh, those would be the the top three. The the border. Is really the easiest one. Yeah. Um, getting turn, turning around our spending is going to be a long process, and it's going to be a tough process. It's going to be tough not only as a as a politician, but it's going to be tough as an American. But we've got to do it, or we lose all hope for future generations. The border is easy. You just you just start to to follow the rule of law yeah. for one thing. Get administration in there that will follow its own laws, uh, and then we fund the border long before we ever think of funding Ukraine, for example. And then you've got the woke stuff. That's a little bit harder, but there is a place for it in Congress because it's woven into so many bills, so many funding bills, so many other policy bills. This uh, social justice baloney. The I mean, you've got uh, transportation justice, you've got environmental justice woven everywhere, and tied with that is not only a cultural change, 
but it's also spending, sp wastefully spending so much money. So we need to pull back on all of that. And actually, I'm going to ask, I'm going to add in a fourth one for you. Accountability. Uh, Congress needs to hold the executive branch regulatory agencies accountable. These bureaucrats that come in and there, there's a two tiered system of justice where they're not, uh, they're not taken to task. They're not paying any penalties. They're not going to jail uh, for the things that they're doing. And Congress needs to stop abrogating that responsibility and actually get down to it. The most beautiful example, well, I guess we have a recent example with the impeachment of Mayorkas. But the most beautiful example, which was a, 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 rig, a big rah-rah cheerleading moment for me, was Senator Rand Paul when he's going after Fauci. I mean, gosh, we need more of that. We need so much more of that. The people want it. The people demand it, frankly. So many great topics to, that we can drill down here. First off, we'll begin with the, the uh, bill that just got passed, the $90-plus billion dollar bill. And of course, our debt counter is nearing $34 trillion. Um, and it, there's at least three sub issues you can talk about with this bill. One is spending and you've kind of already addressed that. So if you're, if you're in the house right now, if you're elected and you're, you're sitting there, are you going to vote yes on this bill? No, no, I'm voting no. Uh, and, and I've said early on, you know, now it's a little bit more popular to say no, it is, it's catching on, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, um, but I was saying no many months ago, uh, right. over a year ago, when we were first starting to fund Ukraine. And the, yeah. the problem was, and I certainly didn't have enough information to know whether they should receive any funding at all. But I did know that we were just sending billions of dollars over with no accountability, right. with no uh, with no way of making sure that that money is going to be paid back. And knowing that that was a country that had a lot of corruption. So, I mean, it makes no sense. No elected official would send their own money over under those circumstances, but again, they're happy to do it with someone else's money. Right. So, so with the spending, we're, we're so free to give it. Um, and it begs another question, which I'll ask in a minute, but what has to happen in order for con Congress to pass balanced budgets? What at the core of it, what has to happen? Is it simply just change out everybody in Congress or, or what, what is it? Well, it is getting more people who recognize how serious the problem is into Congress. And, and that number is increasing. You know, the, the House Freedom Caucus has a lot of good members and, and in both chambers, uh, more and more people are talking about it. Rand Paul and Mike Lee, Senators Mike Lee and Rand Paul, both had have had um, bills or amendments or what have you that would have put us on course for a, a, a balanced budget effectively no more deficit spending and it would have if i remember right taken depending which plan five to ten years to do to turn it around it's a it's a process i would love to be like uh melee in um argentina and take the cha chainsaw you know mm -hmm. I, i'm all for that but if we don't have that type of situation possible then you can do it in a very meaningful um um thought out way where we aren't losing, you know, services and so forth, but we, we can turn it around in, in a decade. Now that sounds to me, that sounds horrible yeah. to take a decade just to get us back to not taking on more debt. But if you look at the, the trajectory we've been on, right. To, to start to turn that ship around. I mean, you know, it, it, that, that would be fantastic because right now we're just plowing ahead right off the cliff. So if we can start to turn it around and in, in 10 years, we can actually be on course to start reducing the debt, not only have a balanced budget, but reduce the debt, that would be a big win. So the, the Paul and Lee plans have, you know, have something to do with cutting by 1% per year. And of course, we do have to look at some of the entitlement programs on ways we can improve those while we hold people whole that are currently dependent on them or will be in the very near future. And we can do that. Uh, again, we have to have elected officials who have a spine and can speak to the constituents to say, this is how we can do it. This is how you're going to be okay. And if we don't do it, this is what's going to happen to your kids and your grandkids. Right. Um, you mentioned entitlement programs. You mentioned other things. Is, is Congress simply entitled? The people in Congress, not all of them, I get it, but is are the majority of them simply entitled and they're kind of just pushing that on? Oh boy, that's a that's a good question. Um, yeah. I think that there certainly is that right. There's there seems to be prestige and power yeah. with these offices. You're you're bumping elbows with the hoity-toity, and the lobbyists right. are throwing money at you, and it gives you probably a sense of purpose. But 
uh, it's it's hard to find, but there are those that go in there and not just sort of talking the talk and knowing the general concepts, but really in their deep core believing in those principles and knowing that if they abandon the principles when they get to a position where they can actually do something about it, they've really they've really just sacrificed themselves and yeah. and, and and would never do. There, there's not a lot, but there's there are some. There are some. Uh, another ish, a sub issue from the uh, this bill that has recently went through uh, the Senate is the United States involving themselves in other wars. Mm-hmm. Isolationist is something that's not a buzzword. Um, well, positive buzzword. How often should the United States be involving themselves in these wars that are happening happening around the world? Well, far fewer than we are now. There are within that question, there are a number of issues of concern. And one is the appropriate role of Congress to declare war and them once again abrogating their responsibilities when they give the authorization for the use of military force and not saying, you know, look, this is important enough. We're going to declare war or we're not. That's where it should that's where it should rest, not with the executive branch to have these forever wars. Mm-hmm. Sending our young people overseas to fight wars for which they don't even really know what they're fighting for is morally wrong. Uh, Additionally, uh, it costs a tremendous amount of money and resources on the part of the United States. It weakens us in many ways. We need to pull back on that, not just from an economic standpoint, but again, from a moral standpoint. Uh, When you look at how, in many cases, we um, we have caused some of the conditions for which we then say we have to go fight a war. Uh, you know, whether it's Ukraine, whether, I mean, in many ways, we, we, having our hand, so we can take a step back and say, maybe we shouldn't have our hand in so many pots of trying to control politics and governments across the world. Maybe we should get our own house in order before we try and control other people's houses. Doing those types of things then sets an environment for which we, in the future, have some excuse or some reason to say, well, now we have to go in and use force. And right now we're fighting, we're fighting wars by proxy, uh, which is again, a bunch of baloney. It leads to loss of resources and eventually to the need to put boots on the ground and loss of life of our American citizens. And we can't, we just can't do that. Absolutely. So, so one of the arguments is, well, we're fighting this war, you know, Ukraine, because if Russia gets too big or if they dominate this, then we see how China will see how they react and they'll be more likely to act in Taiwan. Um, and there'll be a lot more. It's just going to create this massive mess. Do you see that being an outcome? Well, I think that if anything that might um, cause China to act is going to be a lot more on the order of uh, diplomatic weaknesses and what's happening from an economic standpoint with trade and so forth. We are China's <laughs> most valuable trading partner. Okay, money speaks a lot more than than uh, them taking over the territory of a small island nation next door to them. Um, as far as the the Putin rolling over uh, additional countries and getting huge again, I think, again, what we've set up there is a situation in which it could be because of how we we um, manipulated the Ukraine government uh, since 2014 and before and set up a situation uh, that puts Russia into a position where they maybe feel like they have to do this. I don't know. Um, but we made promises that we are not going to expand NATO eastward, and yet that's what we're doing. And I don't know if what they're doing is in response to these broken promises and them feeling threatened about the eastward progression of NATO. I don't know. What I do know is we have our hands in too many pots, and we haven't taken care of things at home, and we have a wide open border, and we've got um, illegal immigrants committing crimes all across the nation. We, we are a country in turmoil. Let's right. fix what's wrong at home before we worry about Vladimir Putin. Last sub issue on this is the border crisis. Um, there, there was a lot of attention that's been tor- turned towards that. Um, and I think even North Dakota, whether they realize or not, has felt the effect with the amount of drugs in, mm. that has filtered into North Dakota from this. Um, but a lot of people felt at least in the conservative side, felt that there should have been more um, support given for the border in the bill if it was if it ha- was going to be passed. If it had to be passed, there should have been more support for the border um, in it. Mm-hmm. Do you, 
what can be done, and you've kind of already addressed it earlier in the interview, but what can be done to fix the border? Is it something where we need to go and spend more money to fix it? Or do we already have the means to fix the border? Right. So both of those, I think we do need to put more money down there, but anything we do down there has to be paid for. It can't be debt spending and we can pay for that. Uh, we have to be serious about it and that's going to take funding. But if we apply the laws that exist and if we have the agencies enforce the laws that exist, that will take care of the vast majority of it. The, we know that there's a mass in, massive increase in migration because of people's awareness of what the current administration's willingness is um, to, to, and not only willingness, but desire to have this, this invasion. I mean, I can tell you, I've gone down to Central America many times, and I know of that there's actually a discussion about a loss of labor, loss of human capital, because they're all going over to the United States because they know this is their opportunity. Um, there's no waiting uh, around for visas to to do it legally, because if you go illegally, uh, it's much faster. You get taken. Uh, free of charge to a city, uh, almost of your choice, but at least a sanctuary city, many times get set up with an apartment with a monthly stipend. I mean, uh, I've said before, I don't blame the folks that are coming up here. I don't blame yeah. them. If I was very poor in a Central American country, and I saw that as an opportunity for my family, you betcha, I'm going to do it. Right. It's not their fault. It's the US government's fault. It's the Biden administration's fault. And so yes, we a country without a border is not a country, we must have a border. Um, and as many have said, you know, yes, we have to have doors, a, a wall with doors. And uh, be, but what we have is what we must do is control the border, we can't let in the terrorists, we have to get a, a handle on all of this crazy fentanyl coming in the human trafficking, all of these things that that the Biden administration and those that support him think are so compassionate about about this situation, they're actually ruining lives. The people that are being trafficked, the drug uh, the overdoses, it's one thing after another. And again, you go in and you just enforce the laws that exist. And we all of us in America will be better off. Absolutely. Switching gears a little bit. Our country was founded with an understanding of the importance of religion. Um, there's references included to it in the Declaration of Independence. Do you think it is important to have godly influence on decisions that are made in regards to our country? Well, that's a very interesting question. Godly influence. Yes, I'll say yes on that. Um, uh, I always, no matter what, whether it's we're talking Democrat versus Republican, or we're talking about a Judeo-Christian society versus a Muslim society, we have to make sure that we aren't implementing a theocracy. Mm -hmm. um, however, everything from the founding fathers going forward is based on a morality, a Judeo-Christian morality, and a an understanding that we need to have that culture and that those the, that moral compass to guide the nation into doing the right thing. So the short answer to your question is yes. Absolutely. Coming to a close, um, what makes you qualified for this run? Why should North Dakota vote for you? I think many people in North Dakota uh, will agree that the that the United States is right right on the edge of going off a cliff. Some will argue that we've already gone off the cliff and we just haven't felt the impact yet. And I don't know, they may be right, but I do know that if we don't try uh, to turn things around, we will be off the cliff. Um, if we're going to turn things around, we also recognize that we need to have a fighter. We need someone with principles who will stand for the principles. And I can, I am uniquely, uniquely in a position to be able to say that. I've got 10 years. There is a reason that the uh, that I'm disliked by the Democrats and by the establishment Republicans, and that is because I stand for principle. I've the, my opponents have said, oh, you know, he's he's too much of a bull in a china shop. Yes, that's what we need. If we're going to fix things, we can't just go along to get along. We can't worry about if we're making friends. We must stand on principle. I'm called too extreme. I like to ask people, it, it, moderation means you're willing to buckle, right? You're willing to compromise on those things. Extreme, what am I too extreme in? I want to I want to know where you want me to be less extreme. I want you I want you to tell me where I should buckle. Should I be less extreme in protecting your free speech rights? Should I be less extreme in protecting your Second Amendment rights? Should I be less extreme in trying to ensure you have the maximum freedom to carry out the lives as you see fit for yourself, your family? Should I be less extreme in that? Absolutely not. And so this idea of being extreme is a narrative that's brought about by progressives, mainstream media. 
And if anything, we need, uh, we can go back to the Goldwater quote, uh, uh, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And that is what we need right now. That's what I represent. Fantastic. If you were to get elected, what would be, we talk about a president's first 100 days in office, right? Um, mm-hmm. And I understand that a rule in Congress is completely different that you don't, you can't sign no, any executive orders in that position. Um, but still, there's going to be some things you're going to be hitting the ground running, working on right away out of the gate. What are some of those immediate goals that, that you have? Right. Is that, that's, a, that's a good question because uh, a lot of times candidates will want to sound like an executive, uh, like a governor or president. Um, this is what I'm going to do in my first hundred days. Well, in Congress, you're one of 435 people. Yeah. What I will do in the, in the first hundred days is um, assert myself as being a fighter for freedom. Uh, and I will uh, work with others to, for instance, in the Freedom Caucus, to advance bills, to maneuver, to get on committee so that I can be most effective in advancing these principles. I will do everything I can for securing the border. Uh, admit, I'm going to learn. There, there are so many ways to make to be more effective when you know all of the administrative rules. So that's one of the big things we're going. I'm going to do when I get there, so that I can be effective in working those rules to advance freedom. Working with what currently is a minority of the Republican caucus that are true conservatives, um, and I really hope that we're going to be able to do a couple of things right off the bat, and that is secure the border. I believe when we get a new president and we have any kind of majority whatsoever, we'll be able to do that. Uh, that would be number one. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you joining us today, Dr. Bechter. It's been a pleasure. It's been a great time. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. If someone wants to support you, where do they go? Ah, thank you. Yes. RickBecker2024.com. RickBecker2024.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This has been another episode of The Conversation here on The Decode and part of our 2024 election uh, cycle coverage. Be sure to go to mydecoding.com, click Election Central there. You'll see a bunch of information on the candidates. Um, Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, become part of the Decoding community. Thanks. Have a great day.